Hello VTubers, Finlich here, and welcome to another weekly rant video. And this week, I'm not alone. I actually have Baseball Lover and the Chew Dude. How are you guys doing today? Great. Hi. Great. That's pretty good, ready guys. To rock and roll. <laughs> oh, I am too. It's been pretty exciting, and it's pretty late for the Chew Dude right now. So please go ahead and check out. I'm gonna say this early this time. So if you're watching right now, go check out Baseball Lovers and Chew Dude's channel because they're doing amazing. Chew Dude, it's pretty late for him, and it's pretty early for Baseball Lovers. So they put in effort to do these videos. So please go give them some love. But let's give off with the topics of this week. First of all, we have a very tragic news to give you guys. Christoph Gudert of I Am Cycling passed away this week. He died in, what is that, a traffic accident? Got hit by a bus after he fell. He, f he crashed on his bike and then got hit by a bus. Ow. Oh, so, uh, yeah, well, he's not the only one who passed away this week. There is a Japanese or Korean guy from Team KSPA who passed away with a heart attack in training as well. So, I mean, do we need some more security or, like, is there anything you can do to apprehend these accidents and deaths? Do you think, that, what do you think about that baseball over? I don't know what you can really do. They, uh, the way I see it is that, you know, he was riding on the street and you fell off your bike. Uh, if it was on some kind of downhill, the bus can't stop. You, you just got to try to find a road that doesn't have a lot of people on it. I mean, that the, luckily these kind of things don't usually happen in races except for San Luis. So, <laughs> oh. but, um... Oh. Shots fired. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just really sad anytime a cyclist goes, and I, I, I hate to say this because there's so many cyclists that have died in similar events recently, but, I mean, I didn't really know any of them. I knew this guy. Like, I have, I have, his, I have his PCM uh, Armada card. <laughs> and that's how I you do. know him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think we all do. But, I mean, yeah, so you're just saying it's a training hazard. It's what you get from doing the sport. I can yeah. kind of agree with that. Do you have anything you want to add to this? Because there's not much to say about this and just have, like, one minute of silence for this guy. I mean... Mm, let's do it, that. It's, it's pretty much a wake-up call for cycling, cycling really. Because um, it's it's really not a safe sport sometimes. Well, when you're training, sometimes not safe when you've got cars on the road. And what I heard was um, there was actually a train or tram track. He got caught between that, and that's what um, made him crash. And uh, I actually have... We actually have tram tracks here in Melbourne, and... That's it's actually really dangerous if you ride by them because you can get your bike, your like tires caught in them, and that's what I heard happen. Um, and then the bus probably came and hit him. Yeah, and again, back with, you know, it, it's pretty much a wake up call because cycling is pretty dangerous when you're riding by yourself, and there's a lot of trucks and whatnot. I've had a lot of like knee misses myself, and uh, I'm sure these guys face it regularly well, during their true. training rides. Yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, it, so what you're saying is if you ride with a partner, not near as many deaths will happen? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, if you're riding, I guess, with a group, um, it's, I believe it's probably more safer. And uh, But the thing is, most of these guys who train by themselves, they, they reckon they get the best results actually training by themselves those days where they're by themselves against the wind by themselves and with no teammates helping them. That That's... What I've heard, um, guys really loving the training, like that's what they get the most improvements from. Um, but certainly, I think it's a bit more full on, I guess. Oh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's, I don't know, there's not much you can do about this. I see it as a training hazard. That is how I see it. It's it's a part of the sport, or not even a sport, it's part of our daily life. Some people crash and people die. Some people crash and they oh my survive. God. So that's Some how people it is. die. Well, oh. that is how it is, though. Like, how can you, how can you apprehend this to ever happen again? I mean, it's just the it's way. It's not it is. that you can stop, but I, I don't think it can be that casual that somebody dies. Like, you know, you, you see it as though like another cyclist dies, but mm -hmm. they didn't, they didn't see it at all because they're dead now. They, they, everything that was going on in their life, every little thing, is now gone. But that's also <clears> taking it to the. I mean, I, I, I know I miss him as a cyclist, but. It's how it is. If, yeah. I remember there's this Danish guy, he got hit by lightning as a soccer player. He got hit by lightning during a match, and he's now like... Wow. I think he died or he's completely retarded now. I don't know. Oh my god, that's I mean, this is just so... a part of the game. It's... You sign up for this, you practice. He could have just been out there. He, what if Chris Dergudet was not a cyclist and just some random guy? He would have crashed and died. True. I mean, it probably True. wouldn't be the same fuss as this now. 
people die. Yeah, true. So it's it's tough. But I guess we'll have like one kilometer of silence starting from 148 kilometers in the peloton. So three, two, one, go. And that was for you, Christophe Gaudet. So, enough for the sadness. Let's get on with some of the more fun topics to talk about. There are some races this week, some very interesting races. First off, I want to talk about the two of them, man. First, oh, this is this is supposed to be a mountain stage, but it's only like the fifth stage is actually a mountain stage, or it turned out to be a mountain stage. But let's talk about it. So, how much have you guys been following the two of of mine so far? Anything oh. like you? I've I've been watching like a lot of the replays of it. I've definitely been keeping up with the replays and whatnot, the the delayed coverage. But um, yeah, that's all the best we can get, I guess. I mean, you you gonna follow the results and uh, it's pretty interesting. With I was expecting more of a, a GC show showdown, but it wasn't really the case with uh, the sprinters really intervening. Definitely. What do you think, baseball over? Have you been following the two of them, man? Um. I've been looking at the results and stuff, but it's the kind of thing where most of the time you don't really have motivation to go back and watch it after you've already known the results and everything. That's very true. But um, I was very impressed uh, in the last mountain stage. Uh, TJ Van Garderen, I was very impressed. <laughs> I I mean, he won. That's that's amazing. If because, you don't uh, count Chris, Christoph Froome. Chris, Chris Froome doesn't count. So he won. That was a really good... um Because... When I'm in five years, he'll win. So, it it was a it was a really amazing performance to beat guys like Perito. If uh, only I it think. worked like that. If only it worked like that. But let's talk about some of the results now. You're mentioning it. So, Andre Greibel and Christoph Alexander Christoph and Peter Zagan won. What like uh, Andre Greibel won two stages and Christoph and Zagan both won one stage of the sprint stages. There's not much to say about these sprint stages, because I mean. Other than saying that Lee Howard missed out on every single stage so far, I believe he got second or third place in every single sprinting stage. Kind of a shame for him. He got to lead, uh, wear the leading jersey. But I did not expect the sprinters showdown at this stage race. Why do you guys think it turned out to be a sprint showdown? Or, I mean, Peter Sagan is not really... The, the stage he won yesterday is not really a sprint showdown, but it, it was a mass bunch sprint in the end. Why do you guys think this happened in a mountain stage like this, a mountain race? You can start baseball over. I don't, I wouldn't call it a mountain race. Um, in PCM 11, at least, my impression was always that uh, Guitar and Oman were the were both flat, mainly flat, and then there was just a one stage. At least that's how it was, judging by nothing but PCM. I, I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but um, I wasn't really surprised with the outcomes. I mean, Greipel had a mechanical when Kristoff won. Other than that, he's pretty much dominated except for the Sagan stage. True. That was mm -hmm. a very exciting stage. Did you guys see the bunny hop that he did? Yeah. To try and get a lead on uh, Nibali and Oran. He tried to do a bunny jump in a, in a roundabout to get a little lead on them. It didn't turn out to be a big lead, but it turned out to be a big enough lead to win him the stage. But I want to hear your opinion on Lee Howard, though, too, dude, because you're Australian. And uh, did he surprise you in this? Did you, did you he expect him to follow big names like Greipel and Christoph? Certainly, I didn't see him actually following him. Um, I always knew he can sprint. He's got uh, some good sprinting legs, I guess. Um, he's he's still very like raw. Like he's still got a lot of pot potential to give. I see. Um, I don't know. It's really uh, really surprising. He could be probably. I know some people already said. Um, some Aussie critics already said that he's probably the better of the young sprinters in the bunch of Orica so far, um, if you don't count Caleb Ewing. Because um, Goss, Matthews, you don't, I, I don't think they're, as, they're going to have the high side sprint power as Lee Howard does if he continues pr to progress. But it's really hard. You don't you know, make these calls really early until they prove their point, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah. very true. But, I mean, I also I was surprised by Lee Howard, i got to say that. But he... Except for winning a stage, he did everything correctly. But last stage, but not or the the last stage that we know the results of, because we're not going to know tomorrow's stage, which is Sunday stage. But yeah, as baseball lover said, Christopher Froome won that stage in front of T.J. Van Garderen and Ron. I believe Rodriguez was in this race, and he was nowhere to be seen. I think fourth. Oh, fourth. fourth. That's nowhere to be seen in Rodriguez <laughs> terms. But yeah. Well, that's no, true. he was third. He got a podium. 
Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, well. No, Uran got third, didn't he? Yeah, no, no, third. no. He Uran will third. get a podium is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So he oh, will get Froom. a podium. But what do yeah. you guys... Froom. Do you guys think that Froome is already in form? Because we saw I think he's already before. in dope, if oh. that's a thing. Well, that is probably a thing, but I know... You can't prove that. You can prove he's in um, form, but you can't prove yeah, he's in dope. That, that's true. So that, that's a shame for most people, though. But, I mean... We saw Froome actually attacking on a flat stage, the stage that Andre Greipel won. He actually attacked away in the downhill to try and get away from them. Do you think that's uh, playing with your like life? Like, what if he attacked in the downhill and got injured? What do you guys think about that? What if there, What if he got? What if he fell and then like a team bus hit him? Well, most people. Well, you just said that it's a shame when Christoph Kudert crashes. He something like that could happen. Well, yeah, that's true. Now, now you're playing the, the, the I don't care guy, and I play the, the guy who's like, ah, that's kind of mean when he is alive. <laughs> well, Christoph Goddard was a, a good cyclist, and Chris Room, he's not. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you say it like that, I mean, it's okay. Let, let's quit that topic, because nothing good is going to come out discussing that yeah. topic, I guess. So, yeah, overall, two of them on. I don't like their coverage that much, but I mean, it's, you get what you what they give you, so we have to live with that. But another race that's going on right now, which I do like the coverage of, is Welta Andalusia. <laughs> and there's been one guy dominating this stage from the beginning. And take guess who that is, that is Alejandro Valverde. What do you guys think of Alejandro Valverde? Can he really pull this sort of form off the entire season? Or is it just one of those pre-season races where just one guy's in form and the rest are trying to get in form? What do you think you do? I I think, um, well, we've seen in the past Valverde has been com trying to compete for the Grand Tours and he's really never at that level to win it. And uh, it's probably, this is probably going to be his last chance at it. Um, they've given him the last shot at the Tour as well. I don't see him uh, coming back to the Tour next year. Um, so I guess you, you never know what he might do this year. I don't know. Um, in the Obviously, these lead-up races to it, he's... Uh, it's really, it's really difficult to tell who's informed because some riders might ride. They're preparing for the Giro, whereas another rider is preparing for the Tour. So the form's always in, you know, that no one's the same, um, really the same. And uh, now Verdi, when we saw him in the time trial, of the first stage, and he won that prologue, um, it was pretty clear that he was going to dominate this stage race. I think um, to everyone. Very true. I agree with that. I still remember the days in PCM where it was Vinucra versus Valverde in the Tour de France, and it was very exciting, and I wish I would have been watching the Tour de France back when it was Vinucra actually dominating. I mean, I, I started watching cycling when he was out, getting out of it, but Valverde was still out there. But, I mean, last year Valverde did get, like, what did, what did he get, fourth place in Tour de France? Fourth. Do you guys remember well, that? he got that fourth. mechanical, too. That's true, in the flash yeah. stage. I mean, yeah, he got, oh, yeah, he, he would have been fifth. Yeah. He fell. Yeah. He got like nine minutes back. That's, That's really... why they went for Quintana. Well, that was not a bad choice either. No, 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 no. that was not <laughs> a bad choice. <laughs> we saw he did really good, but I mean, today's stage was won by Gerald Sirleg, and I think Mount Quebec, their entire preseason is out to like show the the Tour de France guys that we should have gotten this this wild card. We're going to show you. We're going to win some big races and we're going to prove to ASO that we deserve that wild card. Do you guys think they deserve that wild card? Yes. I don't. I don't. You don't? There's there's so many other good teams out there that I think definitely deserve one and haven't got it in the past. Um, I am cycling should have been in the tour last year. Uh, well, the only reason they, they got in this year is because of Chevenel. Yeah. Yeah. They, but they, they got a good side. Um, they're probably better than a few of the world tour teams um i think there's still a lot of other teams in there but there's some teams that do get in there for no reason because they have won like they're just french teams and they just get in for you know for the sake of it just to get more fans i don't know but no, um true. yeah i don't know i don't know it's tough to they don't have who they have who's the best rider that's my headline see you like yeah that's he won the... milan san remo which was kind of lucky though, but it was it was winning Milan San Remo, I guess. Oh, what the heck? Oh, the Peloton just completely split up. Thank you, baseball lover. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh huh. That's me. 
I can't me. do anything. Oh, sorry. Never mind then. But I guess that's uh, that's all that's been happening in the world to Andalusia. There's not much to say other than Valverde is just too strong for the other competitors in that race. Another race that is going on at the moment, so many races are going on, is the Vuelta a Agave. And here we're seeing that Kwiatkowski is really being serious about being a GC mm. contender. He beat Contador in the mountain stage and the time trial stage. He could be really strong. What, what are your yes. guys' opinion on Kwiatkowski? Well, um, uh, they just got the results in and uh, Contador won. Exactly. I was going to mention that. I just saw that on Twitter. But it was yeah. coming up. But what do you think about Kwiatkowski beating because on two stages and losing one stage to him? What do you guys think about that? Do you think this is a guy to be reckoned with in the Tour de France? No. You don't think so? Not right now. No, I, I mean, he's still a young guy. And he's he's kind of more of an all-arounder guy. I see him more as like a, a puncher time trialist. Not really a full-out GC guy. I don't think he'll ever have the the pure climbing ability to do that, although his time trialing could make up for it. He's like a TJ Van Garderen almost. That's very true. What do you, what do you think, Chudu? I, I see, I see um, Kwiatkowski right now. He's so young. I see him really picking. He's he's good all around. He's, he can sprint. He can go time trials. He can go up mountains. But I see him right now really testing his his body out and seeing what works best for him and uh, he'll probably decide in a couple of years time uh, to win a tour probably not he's got he's got a good time trial which definitely helps nowadays um, uh, so winning the tour is a huge thing um, uh, I don't see Quade Kelsey doing it but you never know he might prove me wrong he's he's out he outdid um, Contador so far in a couple of stages and mm -hmm. Contador hasn't been resting he's uh, he Contador put up a picture of his um, cycle computer, and he, he his heart rate got up to 198. So he's really not. <laughs> yeah, he's losing you know, all his red bar. Oh, he's really trying then, I guess. Not a yeah. bad choice. I mean, I I would love to see Contador get back to his form when he beat Andy Schleck. But if that's ever Everyone gonna happen, would. I'm gonna walk around house naked singing Hallelujah, something like that. Because I I want Saxon Bank to actually win a Tour de France. Oh, you mean um, take Tinker. off Saxon? Shut, shut up! Shut up! Small detail. Let me let me have my moment of proudness with Saxo Bank. No longer there. Actually, speaking about that, I actually enjoy this PCM Daily database. I mean, they did a really good job on the jerseys. Yeah. Like, just watching this new Saxo Bank take-off, it looks better in PCM than it does in real life. That's, that's a good job. <laughs> yeah. So, I guess that's, a, that's all with the races at the moment. Not much to say. They're all pretty much one-sided. That's how it feels like. But... In, yeah? Oh. Uh, it definitely feels anticlimactic. I was hoping for some good showdowns between Froome and Rodriguez. Eh, we didn't see much of that, I guess. That only <laughs> happens like one day every year in the Tour de France, or every one or three weeks every year in the Tour de France. That's where everyone is actually trying their balls off. Every every, every other race are yeah. like, nah, let's just this one guy is actually going forward. Let's just just give it to him. We don't want to deal with it. Let's just stroll along. But I mean, there is other topics out there who are also just as crucial to talk about than the stage races. We had some thefts this week. We had Sky at the Tour de Hard War today losing 16 bikes. They got stolen ooh. through the night. What? Yeah, that's... Ooh. Yeah, they got stolen through the night. And, and now, uh, what's going to happen to the marginal gains? Who? Oh, the margin the marginal oh, I know, gains. Oh, I what's going to happen? It's I thought all he said cyclists or something like that. But, I mean, what's going to happen to them? <laughs> that's a good question. They're probably uh, going to come back somehow. They're going to find some money. But uh, they borrowed bikes from uh, es es Eskip BCG. It's some sort of French team. Eskip? I don't even know how to say that. But some some small continental French team borrowed them their bikes so Sky could ride. It's very, very, very nice of them. Because like that's one way of el eliminating the competition. Just don't give them any bikes. Just, hey, we won a stage race in front of uh, Sky. Yes. Also, another team that lost bikes was Garmin Sharp. They had, at the the Tour of Met, they lost their bikes with two stages to go, and they were forced to withdraw from the stage race. How come, for all these years of bike thefts, there is no security? What do you guys think? How can you improve security, and does it need to be you know, improved at all? Or can you just leave it as it is? You can go first base, but lovers, this is Garmin Sharp. Well, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very, I'm, I'm questioning right now, how come Sky was given bikes and Garmin not? Because it's, I think Sky is a bigger name than Garmin. 
I, that's uh, part well, of the reason. No, it's because Sky Sky is is marginal gains. They probably paid them off. <laughs> that's also very likely, actually. Now you I say mean, that. they are rich. They're really but from rich. what I've heard, um, Sky actually had a like a like a small team building like half an hour away, and they got I think five bikes from uh, Paris or something, and they got two bikes from the other team. So it's not like they took heap the whole bike lot. I think it was, it was only two bikes or so. So. Oh. Um, that's what I've heard, so... The people who stole them now have really good bikes, at least. Yeah. Okay, fun fact, I really just want to mention, the reason I'm playing with Vanti on the PCM is because they are following the cycling up on Twitter, and I tweeted out that Jans won an Ahar today because he got second place, and Roy Jans just favored that tweet from the cycling up. Just a small <laughs> little fanboy moment there. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really cool in my book. I mean, it's funny how I have to... I, I do have to have my cycling hub mentioning in every video of the RAM video so far. I've been doing really good. <laughs> Just sneaking it Yay. in there. Okay, but yeah, back to the the theft. Good job. I was reading Twitter. Back to the theft. So, you guys think it should be secured or not? Like, how can you add bodyguards to the trucks? Have them in there oh, with, like, M4s? And, bodyguards. Like, I mean, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> Well, Just race security stop. guards should be able to. They should be. They should be there, and they should be guarding the area. <laughs> Sky can afford them. They, you well, can't Sky that. can afford them. But what about the other teams? Do you think Garmin yeah. can afford it? I think. No. I think that should be something that the actual race organizers should be the ones to deal with. It's Not on an individual basis by the teams, but the problem is, is that most races, unless you're a world tour race, cannot uh, fund that kind of thing. Especially races like um, San Luis, because they are the ones stealing the bikes in San Luis. <laughs> no. So, yeah. Well, you I, want to I hear know. how Saxon Bank Tinkoff deals with this? Because I read this in a, a blog somewhere. Saxon Bank Tinkoff, they always park their truck with like the backside up against the wall, and they have like a fence around it. Like they have like a portable fence, and they park it right outside the hotel. So they already like they have so much security, and it's because it's all of Tinkoff. Like it was his idea to do all this. So it's madman with mad ideas, but they seem to be working because Saxon Bank has not had a theft in a while now, so pretty good. Uh, yeah. So other interesting topics now we're nearing the end of the stage. If it goes on, we just start off a small stage and we keep talking because there's a lot of very interesting topics. This might be the longest weekly rant because there's so much to talk about. Peter Stedna, one of the American guys that I really enjoy watching actually, came up with this idea that cycling is a very unfriendly sport for newcomers. So therefore, he wants to try and steal some of the, the ideas, the perspectives in soccer, basketball, uh, baseball, whatever, steal some of their ideas and put it into cycling. One of his ideas was that we should have permanent race numbers. So you know how in football you have uh, Blair Walsh with number three from the Vikings? He's always number three. He never changed his jersey. Well, in cycling, he wants Froome to always wear number one on Team Sky. He wants Kettle Evans to always wear number one on, t on BMC. Something like that. What do you guys think about this? Is it a bad idea or a good idea? I want to hear baseball over first because I know your opinion on this. Um, I think it's a bad idea. And the reason it's a bad idea is because when you're playing a one-on-one -on -one game with someone, yeah, you can have two people have the same number because they have diff totally different jerseys on. Yeah, whatever. In a giant peloton, people with num with the same numbers is just going to be confusing. Plus, that's a way to organize every single rider in the race. That's that's how you do it. You have to put the number on them. It's like a marathon. And if they all have the same numbers now, even outside, because you can't have if if Froom and all of Sky are on the um, there's there's way more than the max mount so you would have to have like regular people having the same numbers just random numbers out there like baseball and stuff i i just i don't like that idea i like the idea that you you can organize everybody in the race and i don't think that a casual fan um at least in the sports that i've that i watch a casual fan isn't going to remember the number first anyway so they could see a number and at least know what team a guy's on or something if they think about it I, I don't I don't understand. Plus, I don't really care about newcomers anymore. <laughs> oh, well, the sport does. We need newcomers to survive in this sport. But what do you think, you, dude? What is your argumentation I'm for it? I'm actually very 
for this argument because I really think it's so it's so tough to see who's who in a bunch sprint. Think about how quick they're going, and you just really can't tell who's who really. Like I was watching a sprint when Christoph won. I had no clue it was Christoph. <laughs> If there wasn't no commentators, like I wouldn't have a clue who it was. Um, even a lot of com- uh, commentators are, I know are complaining um, how difficult it is, and it, they got at least make a change to make it more viewer friendly, definitely. And uh, you never well, know um, if yeah. That's so fast true. in a bunch sprint, bunch sprints you see usually from the front or high above. You're not gonna be able to see the number anyway. That's true. Well, it's it's very difficult though. But yeah. you gotta imagine you're watching this from a newcomer's perspective. He's not, he's really not looking at the numbers though, but if he spots a number, if he spots a number, if, he's, he, if he gets lucky and he spots a number, he's going to know who it is. Because, oh, oh, he remember, okay, he's watched two races maybe, and it's two different races, he knew, oh, in this stage, uh, Froome was number one. Oh, so he must be number one in this, oh wait, it's Wiggins, what the heck, this sport is dumb. I mean, something like that is going to happen, and we've got to mm, make it more I- friendly to everyone watching, that's... Just my opinion. Oh, I'm getting blocked big time by Sabatini. That's oh, well, dumb. I'm Are we seeing who's going to so win this race? Not me, because I can't see well, anything. Well, Look who's going to win this race. It's actually Viviani. But guys, we're going to continue talking, so we're just going to... Don't mind the gameplay anymore. We're going to continue talking, because uh, there's still a lot of topics I want to talk about. But all in all, I think this sport should be more viewer-friendly. If it comes with the numbers, or it comes with some other ideas, I don't know. Like, the one thing that my mom used to say is she doesn't want to follow the sport anymore because of the teams keep switching names. She, uh, she used well, to Well, that's something laugh. that, yeah, I, they could definitely incorporate that from, like, uh, American sports and soccer and everything uh, with, like, you know, having a name. And you could still have the sponsor on the jersey, but then that's the whole funding because you can't, you don't have, um, you don't have funding from, like, actual owners and stuff. That's true. It, you kind of need that. You need that advertising revenue to keep the sport going. And I don't like that, but I feel like that's just the kind of the way it is at this point. Because, like, what she, she, she used to love Kasista Pan back in the day, and then she stopped watching for one year. And when she then came back, it was called Movie Star. And she's like, where's Kasista Pan? I'm like, it's Movie Star. No, it's not. You're lying. I'm like, it's Movie Star. No, you're not. <laughs> and, like, old people don't like change. And I actually don't even like change. So I like, don't I'm like change either. Yeah, exactly. I don't like change. I don't even think anyone likes change, to be honest. But, uh, so that's one of my pet peeves, is try to keep the names similar every year. It's difficult. But what do you think about this too, dude? Do you like the name switching? Does it keep the sport alive, or does it kill it? Oh, I think it's a, it's a whole sponsor thing. It's all about money. No one, to be honest, these guys, the owners and things, they don't really care about what the name is. All they think about is money. Um, it's all a business thing, really. And th- to be honest, they wouldn't, the only reason why they want their riders to win is it will get the sponsors across the line first and get front stage on the cameras, really, if you think about it. I mean, it's all, it's all about getting stage time and money, and uh, that's, how, that's what keeps the sport running, really. If we didn't have sponsors, um, th- this, this sport's dead, really. Very um, true. That's very yeah. true. I guess that, that kind of concludes that topic that it's you can do nothing without money and this money dictates everything in the sport. So we need to find a way to make it viewer friendly and still like monetizable. Something like that. It's difficult. But on to the next topic I want to talk about. If you guys, by the way, if you guys have any opinion or way to, to uh, like any solution to these problems, type in the comment section below and we'll take a look at them and we might discuss them in a later episode. But next topic that I want to talk about. The one hour record right now is held by Bradley Wiggins, I believe. Is that correct? I believe no. it is. But uh, we not. have <laughs> Fabian Cancellara is going to try to beat that record and he's going to do it in Mexico. It's going to do it in an arena or a velodrome where eight other records have been beaten before. And the reason he's going to Mexico to beat this one hour record is because the air is thinner and he can therefore take more, uh, uh, he gets less oxygen, I guess, but he goes way faster, like his uh, maximum capacity goes up by a lot. So he's gonna be able to go faster, but take in less oxygen. Do you guys think Cancellara can beat Wiggins one hour record? Or should he have done this when he was in tough shape? What do you guys think well, about him doing it in Mexico? I'll start, I'll start off first, we'll get technical. Um, the record's actually held by Chris Broadman. Yeah, 56, yeah I was just looking fi- that up. That's not... 56Ks um, well, Wiggins is the record. At some point. I, I think no. all these guys... Are, oh. All these all these guys got caught for doping or something, and apparently yeah, he only yeah, needs 49Ks and 
in an hour. I don't know if you can, I don't see this as a smart thing to do because this is a lose lose situation. If he doesn't get the record, um, it's it's a waste of time really. And if he does break the record, everyone's going to put claims on him as doping and all this because I. If he does break it, because all these guys who've hold, held the record before are all dopers, and if he breaks the record, it's going to look like he's doping as well. So yeah, there's really no point doing it. I guess he needs motivation to do something because he's won every single race there is. He won like all the classics and well, whatever he's done. Oh, he's got probably needs some motivation, I guess. He needs something to do. That's very true. But I mean, it's not a, in my opinion, it's not a lose lose situation because it gives PR to the team. Like something that Radio Shack or Trek Factory now is lacking is nobody knows this team. It's a new team. This is one way to give some uh, publicity to this team. And I don't think it's a lose-lose situation. I think it's a win-win situation, in my opinion. Because either he wins the record and he gets fame, and he's probably people are gonna think he's dope anyway. That comes with the sport. But then yeah. they also get money because it's gonna be on live television. So they're going to get PR from this and an upcoming races. They might get fans from this and get a bigger fan base. And this what a team like this needs someone to cheer for them because it's difficult liking a team that nobody knows. What do you think? Let me tell you something. Oh, you can go. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't really have much to say about that. I agree. Okay. What do you a, a guy, a guy going around in circles for an, an hour? That's going to be good TV coverage. It, no, it, actually, it, I would actually enjoy what <laughs> That sounds like it's, cycling! That is cycling. It's, it's, the that's what most people hour. say about cycling now. Yeah. But I, I think that I, I don't think that I, I don't like it because it's good TV coverage for me personally. I just think that that's the kind of thing that will get people amped up and want to watch the cycling think that's because more, it's, it's such like a big deal. It's, I actually think it's more interesting to watch a guy go in a circle for an hour instead of guys going on the road for an hour. I actually think people will enjoy that more. Because it's action packed, it's fast paced, it's no breaks, he just keeps going around. And there's nice commentary, nice music, showing replays of what he's done before, showing videos. For me, it sounds like really nice. I might actually have to record that in the cycling up. Because for me, it sounds really cool. But I guess not everything can be cool in everyone's opinion. <laughs> so, but we're nearing the end of this episode, guys. Do you have anything you want to talk about closing closing arguments in any case? Any topic we talked about? Closing argument is that. Uh... Uh... I'm guilty. Uh, basically, <laughs> um, that everyone is doped, except for anybody that I like. Okay, so everyone's doped. Okay, what are you saying, Chi dude? Closing arguments. Uh, closing arguments. Oh, I don't really have much, actually. Okay, so. Um, oh, you don't have much? Yeah. I can end it off. So, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I think it was the longest weekly rant so far, and I really enjoyed it. There are some good topics to talk about this week. Can't wait till we get further into the season where there's going to be better topics, better results, better showdowns. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Go check out both guys. As I said at the beginning of the video, they do billion stuff. They need some love. They need to get bigger. This community needs to be bigger, and it all starts with you guys. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys later.